going to be making noise the whole time, Brandon? I'm going to try not to. I could move somewhere. I guess <laughs> we'll I could, I could just move. let the audience know that in the background, our production man is doing his job. So you might hear some label sheets getting moved around and some bottles getting and some, labeled. And, and some uh, like laughing and snickering yeah, like oh my god <laughs> yeah think of brando as your conscious mind and brandon as your <laughs> unconscious mind <laughs> that's fair. and frank as the devil, <laughs> the devil on your shoulder <laughs> hey uh, yeah yeah you know, i i like to think of myself as your bee like if you had a bee sitting on your shoulder okay, that's or, fair. yeah i can see that okay <laughs> Or if the rainbows could talk to you. <laughs> My friend this weekend, he was like, you're on the rainbow planet. I mean, think about it. There's rainbows everywhere around here. The water that you drink, if you shine light through it, it becomes a rainbow. So you're drinking rainbow juice. I was like, oh my gosh, this guy talks like I do. No wonder we're friends. Rainbow juice, I've heard that one before. Oh, meat is, meat is rainbow juice, man. It's sunlight you can drink. <laughs> All right, so today we want to talk about the 6S tasting method, where it comes from, a little bit of history on it, uh, what it is, and give you guys a little example of it with our new, what's, what meat are we drinking? We are drinking Mineola Sunshine Rain, or basically a semi-sweet, uh, Wildflower, organic wildflower honey, traditional, with mineola, which is like a tangerine that grows here in Southern California, with a really great um, lemony flavor profile. Uh, the juice was added post-secondary. All right. So that's what we'll be doing the 6S method with a little bit later on. But why don't you give us a little history on what the 6S tasting method is for Cool, so 6S Tasting Method is designed and shared to take folks who are like, okay, this whole sitting around and like nerding out over how something tastes, I don't know if I can really do that. And it's like, well, if you can remember the six S's, then you can sit around and nerd out over how something tastes. But hopefully that's to unlock layers and layers of enjoyment that have previously been occluded by, um, our lack of awareness of our incredible body's capacity to sense things and enjoy things. So with the 6S method, we're gonna basically work through all of the senses and how to engage with a mead so that we can really deeply enjoy it. Uh, and all you have to remember is that the 6S means sight, sniff, sip, swish, swallow, and savor. Some people add two more S's, many add eight S's, which is the last two are smile and share. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> first pretty easy. Yeah, uh, you know, some people aren't so good at those two parts, but we're, we're working on it. <laughs> if we can get them through the first successes, maybe they'll be better at the last two. Hey, 2022, it's a lot easier to do that. Uh, yeah, we're lucky. Um, there are some folks who are still having a hard time. <laughs> You know, That's true. And, then, and they have deep mean traditions in those parts of the world. Um, so I'm hopeful that the 6S method will turn into the 8S method and bring the world together. Okay. That's fair. <laughs> did you create the 6S method all on your own? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, so we were teaching classes at UC Davis, and I'd, I'd get invited to all different kinds of presentations about mead, whether it was like a wine uh, making group, or home brewing group, or um, the beekeeping groups. People were like, whoa, mead's a lot. There's a lot going on here. And I was like, okay, well, it ultimately comes down to what do you experience, and do you like it? And people are like, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> you know? um, it's like being a kid and drinking coffee the first time. It's yeah. like, oh, what is going on here? Or, you know, dark chocolate, like these wonderful things that are super complex and multi-layered, but like when you're little and you try them, you're like, oh, this is so much. I, I don't know if I like it or not. So we broke it down into six uh, unique elements of the tasting experience. And, and they're stacked in a way 
that you slowly acclimate your body to get ready to put the substance inside your body, which is a pretty big deal. This body will be, or rather, this substance will become a part of your body. So when you drink this, um, you start by looking at it, then you go to sniffing it, then you go to sipping it, and all of those things prepare you for the next step, which is swishing, and then swallowing, which is like a deep evolutionary protection mechanism. Our body has a mechanism in its brain that says, this drink could kill you. And it's scanning this drink until you finally decide to swallow it, right? That's the reflex that makes you spit something out when it's just like, ah, like battery acid, right? If someone served you battery acid and you put it in your mouth, you go, Pleh. that it would kill me. I'm not gonna drink that. Has someone served you battery acid? I mean, I've had a mead that tasted like battery acid oh, smells. Okay. And like, it was so atrocious that I, that, that, mechanism happened okay. and like thank god that it did but then when ken Shram explained that that's like a known neurological function and we evolved it so that we rejected things that would kill us um i got it like that made sense and then when you swallow apparently you decide that this thing's not going to kill you and so whole whole layers of sensory perception are available to you now because that spit out mechanism is off so that's the swallow piece. You're gonna get more information there. And then savor is like bringing your attention to how you feel after you've drunk this beverage, which I think is a key thing that a lot of people overlook for a, a large portion of their drinking experience. And if they start to tune into that, then they can start to almost make healthier uh, decisions in their drinking. Because if your body feels good after you drink something, it's okay to have more of it. If your body starts to feel bad, should probably stop having it but a lot of people just focus on the flavor up front not the overall effect so yes i invented this and i'm very passionate about talking about it that's awesome no i know <laughs> 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 so so you invented it it's a full scope method on how to savor mead yep. And you would include, you can do other beverages with it too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we call it the 6S method of mead appreciation. Okay. DM, Golden Coast Mead. <laughs> fair, fair enough. No, uh, I mean, we've seen some other people use it on like Instagram and stuff. And, you know, that's, that's the thing about being a creator in these days. You want that attribution right, man. No, you want people to be empowered and you want people to acknowledge when they're uh, using someone else's work. So hopefully I do that. If I don't, call me out on it um, because I, I want to model that when we reference each other, we help each other and we help build an alternative culture that can hopefully get us to the future we want to see, which is regenerative and joyful and empowers everybody. Co-create the dream. Co-create the dream, baby. That's my inner aim. That's a regenerative business principle all of us having inner aims brando's i've heard is what have you heard about me I, i've heard that uh wait there's take your time in a hurry that's brando's yeah and brando's is oh hit me with it brando what's uh, your inner aim stay curious stay curious that's right ted lasso not judgmental not judgmental and he's actually referencing walt whitman right? yes it's a walt whitman quote that's that's it yeah yeah, soon we'll have more Ted Lasso to learn I'm from. I'm stoked on that. <laughs> okay, back to success method. Um, I think my last question to you before we started okay. is, do you ever intend to put like a grading system to the success method? Oh. And my only reference is coffee on this. Mm. And so like when you grade specialty coffee, there's like a numerical value you give each of the 10 categories nice. there's only six in the success so would you ever want to put point totals for each category for example each category has five points you can score one 1.25 1.5 1.752 all the way up so like a total a meet could get it in total 30 points yeah yeah and or picking it could up what score you're down. 10 or whatever. Is that something you would ever want with the method or no? So my initial reaction is that the method is more aimed at like 
advanced beginners to intermediate tasters, okay. right? It's, it's a way to step from, whoa, this is overwhelming, to like, okay, I'm picking this up. But the next step after the success method is kind of qualifying as a judge. And, and there's a lot more nuance to being a judge. For, for instance, people can study for the beer judge certification program, mead judge mm -hmm. uh, certificate. And if they take that and pass it, uh, which I did without studying in 2014. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. No, I was pretty proud of that. Um, <laughs> our friend like told us, hey, we're doing the BJCP Me Judge certificate. And I was like, oh, we are? And they're like, yeah, tomorrow. And I was like, okay. And he's like, you'll be good. You just have to like learn some multiple choice questions, which is like how to be a professional judge. You know, like don't be a jerk basically. And don't assume you know anything that you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, which is important for life, mm -hmm. uh, unless you're a parent. No, uh, <laughs> then you know <laughs> Then you need to, you know, be honest if you're questioned directly. <laughs> but um, yeah, basically, don't be a jerk and don't assume you don't you know anything you don't know is like BJCP fundamentals. And then you've got to know some technical specifics about honey and fermentation and uh, phenols and esters and fusel alcohols and like these more technical things but once you learn them you take this test if you pass it which includes some like open answer stuff that gets ju reviewed by like master judges and they ask you like what would a cotton blossom honey mead taste like what would you be looking for in a cotton blossom honey mead and uh, you know you have to just write a short essay hopefully it's soft <laughs> no, you have to like study what does honey, cotton honey taste yeah. like and what does it turn into in meads typically and um, they give you points and if you don't get enough points you don't get the judging thing so when I, when I got it uh, relatively early in my professional meads career I was like cool I know what I'm doing to some extent <laughs> um, you so, get, like that pat on the back like yeah you're doing some things right and, and I think that that relates to your question because Mead is so big and broad, right? Mm -hmm. There are so many characteristics of so many styles of mead that if you just tried to boil it down with these six S's, I think you'd be boiling off a lot of the nuance and the things that make mead really special. And that doesn't mean that you can't, you just gotta qualify it. Like, saying that this, you know, cherry mellow mel hydromel is not good when you're comparing it to braggots is like, well, you're, you're missing the point. Like a cherry mellow mel hydromel can never be a braggot. What's a braggot? Yeah, so a braggot is a beer, a mead made with grain. Oh, okay. Right, alongside it. It's not a honey beer. A honey beer would have less than 51% of the fermentable sugars from honey, whereas a braggot would have 51% of the fermentable sugars or more from honey. Gotcha. Okay. And those two just to taste totally different. Yeah, like a cherry hydromel, melomel is going to be like light and a little bit of cherry, but like it's not going to have a lot of flavor. Whereas like a braggot is going to be this rich, caramely, like intense flavor profile thing, unless you were going for like a hydromel braggot. But anyways, if you don't know what those terms mean and you just start like mushing things together, your palate is fundamentally skewed by what you've drunk just before it. Yeah. So it's not like coffee where it's like, Yo, we're drinking this roast, this bean, you know, this growth, and we're comparing them A to B. And even like a French roast versus a Colombian roast are like close enough. Right? Yeah. And so I think what you're describing, so essentially for the 6S to have that numerical value to it, you would want to take it to another level of, of specificity. Of specificity. Yeah. Which is something that Mead Institute is exploring <laughs> right now is like, how do we take the BJCP standards, which were designed by beer people, mm -hmm. which kind of take a reductionist approach, like, okay, everything starts at 100, and then based off flaws, you get reduced down, and then that's your score. Gotcha. Versus a wine sommelier approach, which is like, okay, within the theoretical concept of this, this beverage and its potential, like a Merlot from France, yeah. how does this one perform? Yeah. And, and what is there that's good about it? And how does that all stack into this complex and, and valuable thing? You know, quality beverage. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at different definitions of quality. And the W set, which is the wine spirits, 
uh, something training, education training. Okay. Uh, Allison Tram is the WSET rep on, at the Mead board, so she'd be able to talk a lot more about it, which we could do. We can interview her. Um, but there's this question about quality, and WSET defines quality as balance, um, complexity, length, and intensity, right? So, like, those are kind of counter posed things. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you're, if you're good, you know, balance, intensity, complexity, and length, like that's a rich, high quality beverage. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of different versions of all of those. Exactly. And style, stylistically, some styles will be capable of expressing those things in different ways than other styles. Mm -hmm. So if you're just trying to reduce it down to a number without qualifying that, you're missing a huge amount of the beauty and the art of making something that lights up people's lives. Perfect. Okay, so the 6S tasting method is for beginners to beginner maybe, yeah. essentially. And it's just a, a good way of introducing yourself on how to enjoy mead and what are you tasting and just being able to share that with everyone you're tasting it with. Yeah, and then we, we have a new tool from the Meat Institute that's like the next level before you get certified and start you know trying to be a sommelier or a meat judge, um, and that's the Meat Institute's tasting grid, which is like much more in depth and it helps to train you. And then it gets you a written document of what your experience was with a whole language chart on the back that helps you kind of navigate these things. So. This is like a first pass tool when you're just like, oh yeah, I'm new to me, let's try this. Let's use the six S's. Then when you're ready to develop more, you can use the tasting grid. And then when you're ready to go all the way, you can study for hopefully whatever alcohol tasting certification you're most excited about. And hopefully Meat Institute will have one in the future. Perfect, okay. Okay. Cool. So let's start tasting. Great, let's we're gonna open, open this bottle. bottle. So, Mineola Sunshine Rain, a hyper-local product for the Mead people. Perfect. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Three ounces is a good start? Yeah. All right. So, three ounces is a good tasting pour. It's enough to uh, enjoy, but not too much to get inebriated, hopefully. We're dealing with a 12% ABV mead here, so three ounces is a half of a serving of alcohol. Um, and we like to say uh, two drinks, one to two drinks, that's not bad. Three drinks, unless you're at a party, you might want to reevaluate your relationship with alcohol. Uh, <laughs> so, and then what else? Uh, if you are having three drinks, you definitely need to coordinate your, your transportation. Fair enough. Okay, so the first S is... Or not transport yourself. Just stay where you're at. Stay where you're at. Yeah. So okay. Sight. Right? Sight. Yeah. All right. What are we looking for in sight? Okay, so sight, you're just, you're, you're talking about what you see because your body is going to start referencing all the other things you've seen that look like this, right? So when I hold this up to the light, I see... What color, Brando? It's like yellow, golden... Yeah, a little hazy. What do you think there, YouTube land? If you're just on Spotify, we're looking at a beverage and we're holding it up to the YouTube camera because we're recording these podcasts on video. Um, so you can see the pictures. Maybe we'll put them in the show notes. I don't know how this stuff works, but Brando does. He's a wizard, ladies and gentlemen. Um, magic is stuff that people don't understand, in case people didn't know that. Um, and when you learn things that people don't understand, you are on your journey to being a wizard. And Brando has proven that he's a wizard on multiple levels. Um, so this is, yeah, straw golden in color, um, right? If you held up a piece of straw next to it, it would be the same color. Mm -hmm. And then we're looking at clarity. We're looking at uh, carbonation, and we are looking at density. So bubbles are sticking to the cup. Uh huh. Okay. But there are some bubbles, right? Yeah. So for sure. But yeah, that means it's not totally still. So it's mildly carbonated. Mm -hmm. Cloudiness. We haven't talked about clarity. It's a little hazy, right? It's not super clear. Well, what is it? It Okay, so clarity has some technical specifications. Okay. And 
First one is, can you hold your finger up to it and see your finger through the other side? No, I can't. The answer is no. So this is cloudy. Now, it's not murky. It's not like there's a cloud of gray haze floating in this. Mm -hmm. But it is, a, it is technically cloudy because you can't see your finger. And then, like, if you can see your fingerprints, then we're getting to clear. And then if you shine a light into the beverage and the light looks brighter through the liquid, then it's brilliant. Oh, wow. So, yeah. okay. so you can, like, hold it up to a light and, you know, the light does not look brighter in the liquid. So it's definitely not brilliant. It's going to be cloudy. It's going to be straw gold. It's going to be... Uh, petalant or there's some kind of carbonation and then we're going to talk about viscosity so we're going to swirl the glass and what happens well we kind of get some these bubble stick yeah we kind of get these sheets that hang on for a bit they open up but there's no real legs to speak of so it's like a sheeting middle viscosity when you say legs what do you mean yeah, so if you take a high tannin, high acid, high sweetness mead and you run it around your glass, you're gonna get these ropes of clear liquid that hold onto the glass and resolve after the mead has settled in gotcha. the bottom of the glass. So, um, Shram and Bakalich know a lot about this, a lot more about this than I do, and, and Carbon too, Wilson. Um, my understanding is that it is related to complexity and intensity, but they like to correct me whenever I bring that up. So oh, okay. I'm still learning. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> so from the site, from everything we just mentioned, is there anything you could guess what this would taste like? or how Well, that would use? bias people. Okay. So I don't want to get it. So let's talk about social influence as social animals. So humans... I don't know if anyone else has ever witnessed this, but say we're all standing in a circle and we all are talking about something and someone who's really opinionated says something. What do the people in the circle do? Generally, you tend to agree with them. Well, you could, like, you could just kind of like look around and see what everyone else is thinking, right? <laughs> and like what their reaction is when this opinionated person states this opinion, right? Mm -hmm. And like... If it's an agreeable opinion, if the person is saying something that the group typically like agrees with, then yeah, other people are gonna like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if like a person comes in from left field and is like, ah, you know, insert whatever crazy comment here, like you're probably gonna check the other people in the circle and be like, do other people agree with that around here? Mm -hmm. Right? Like we're social animals. We take yeah. cues from each other because we've evolved to know that like, if I get kicked out of this group, there's a much lower chance that I'm going to survive. Yeah. So I have found, and there is research to suggest, and there is a lot of practice within scientific tasting arrangements that humans influence each other when yeah. they're tasting each other, or when they're tasting things together. So if you go to UC Davis and you participate in a sensory analysis course or study, there are partitions that they put between people so the, and then they might even manipulate the lighting so you can't even like see the color of the thing you're eating or tasting and so all you're left to do is like engage with your smell and engage with your taste and then write down your own impressions so you're not seeing what your neighbors are reacting how your neighbors are reacting and you're not seeing even the visual stimulus of the product which is highly variable potentially you're just smelling and tasting things and writing notes on that gotcha. so if I were to start talking about what I would think, it would probably bias your experience. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I agree with that. I think where I was trying to go with that question was, what can one glean from doing the sight part of the 6S method when they're like doing it with me? So like what could one expect if like it's really bubbly? What can one expect if the viscosity is high? Yeah. What are yeah. some generalized things that people, if they're looking at meat and they're doing this first step, what's what what are some general expectations tied to certain things? That's a great question. So that comes back to kind of that uh, scope and scale question, right? Because you can go so many different directions, but you do start to witness certain characteristics and then start to draw expectations based off the characteristics that you witness. So in carbonation, which I think is a very straightforward, there's mm -hmm. basically three options, right? There's sparkling, where bubbles are just coming. I mean, there's overcarbonated, where like it foams out of the glass, mm -hmm. right? Um, or the bottle, like this happens in me 
frequently, especially homebrew. Um, hopefully much less in professional commercial mead these days. Um, but rapid evacuation, where there's so much carbonation in the bottle that when you open it, the carbon dioxide molecules are like, finally escape! And as they rush out, they grab other ones that are like super eager to come out of the solution because there's so many of them in the bottle that they then grab onto each other and then you have a mead volcano. And that sucks. Uh, <laughs> so that would be an overcarbonated mead. Um, then there's number two, which is like carbonated or, or sparkling. And like, there is a technical difference between carbonated and sparkling, okay. where carbonated is forced carbonated and sparkling is the result of natural fermentation bubbles being maintained within the liquid. Okay. Um, and that can be done both in bulk and in the bottle. So we'll leave that for now. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> basically that's gonna affect mouthfeel, right? If there's a lot of bubbles in the liquid, you're gonna feel that carbon dioxide on your tongue and it's yeah. gonna be perceived as acidity in mead because buffer capacity of mead is typically so low that a little bit of carbon dioxide results in a citric or a, a tart acidic flavor. Um, like the difference between drinking a flat soda and a sparkling soda, yeah. right? A flat soda tastes a lot sweeter, whereas a sparkling soda is nice and bitey mm -hmm. uh, because that carbon dioxide is providing that acidic flavor profile. Because mm -hmm. hydrogen molecules are negative on the pH scale and then the more of them that there are. Anyways! So the more bubbly, the more bubbles you see, there's a chance for higher acidity in your cup. Yes, and brighter kind of bubbly tasting experience. Thank you for bringing us back. Sure. Uh, this is fun to have you drive and I just get to opine from the passenger seat. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> um, so the second variable, or rather carbonation can be overcarbonated, sparkling or carbonated. And then petulant, which is this middle range between sparkling carbonated and still, mm -hmm. or flat, right? Um, flat kind of denotes that you lost the bubbles. Still means that you intentionally didn't have bubbles in it in the first place. Uh, petulant means there's some bubbles, so you're gonna get some of that sparkly action, but it's not gonna be popping on your tongue. Mm -hmm. and Just then, a more mild version of sparkling. Yeah, and there's a few words to describe it. Petulant, not to be confused with petulant, uh, which is an ill-tempered child, uh, but petulant is a little bubbly, uh, and the Italians call it frizzante, and other people call it crackling. It's kind of a fun thing to play with words if people are into that. And then the next one is still, which means that it's flat, and there's no bubbles, and um, that means that it's gonna be what you get. Like, there's not gonna be carbon dioxide bumping it around in your mouth, and, and you know, creating whatever carbon dioxide dynamics are in a mead that would be petalant or sparkling. Okay, so I think my next question is, how is mead most commonly served? Served, is it usually carbonated or is it usually still? Or is it just everywhere? No, I love it. Like, that is a question that does not have a true answer. Okay. I mean, actually I'm biased because I like sparkling and petalant meads okay. more than I like still meads typically. There are amazing still meads that I will drink every time someone puts them in front of me. But in, given the choice between two traditional um, or varietal honey meads and one is sparkling and one is still, unless it's super sweet, I'm probably going to want it sparkling. Okay. And that's my own personal opinion. Uh, because I think it brings out the floral characteristics of the honey and it creates a balance point for the honey, you know, perceived perception of sweetness. And then also creates a counterpoint with the alcohol. So like the stool, the three-legged stool of mead flavor stands up because the carbon dioxide is there. Mm -hmm. But that being said, there are a lot of still traditionals out there. There are a lot of still dessert wines that are meads, uh, or dessert style meads. And then... Because wine is just a cheap knockoff of mead made from grapes. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm trying to decolonize my brain That's from the fair. Roman <laughs> viticulture colonization. Uh, <laughs> that happened around zero uh, BC. Uh, <laughs> BCE, if you want to use science. Um, so anyways, here we are, and I'm talking about lots of things that... Mead, mead is at the center of the universe, ultimately. And 
what you have in front of you is what you need to deal with. So saying that it's typical is kind of difficult. And I would discourage people from doing it until there's a global mead industry where there are like global brands that are known. Gotcha. And then we can talk about typical meads. Okay. So it's just different wherever you go. Just be aware of there yes. are sparkling, there is petaline, there are still meads. And that's like a great question to just ask to calibrate your brain and to communicate with the person. Like, I'm going to go to Scotland, and there's a dude that makes mead there in Perthshire, uh, like on the east coast of Scotland, and he makes still meads, you know? And he's like, oh, you make sparkling meads. And it's like, if I bring him some of my mead and I get to taste his meads, like our worlds are going to collide mm -hmm. because they are fundamentally the same. We're both mead makers, but fundamentally different. Like, mm -hmm. we make sparkling petalant meads and he makes still meads. And so when we drink each other's stuff, like if I'm trying to compare it with my stuff A to A, it's not going to be a, a worthwhile comparison. But if I'm approaching it like his stuff is different, what can I learn from this? And yeah. you know, what, what, what can I really enjoy and uh, potentially integrate into our craft here? And like he does a lot of wild crafted herbs and then uses local honey. And so like I'm super excited to, to learn about that and have that experience. Awesome. All right, so that's site. Let's move on to sniff. It's the next S, right? <sighs> yeah, I love this S. This S is sniff. So your job, so glassware matters. Um, these are tulip shaped Belgian tulip uh, beer glasses and they're made for complex beers that actually have a nice aroma. The typical shaker pint that like a beer is served in at a bar sucks for aroma it's made to actually make the aroma fall out because it was made for the macro beers macro lagers of the world that if you smell them closely actually smell like flawed fermentation oh it's okay deep breaths yeah and that's why like coors has a indication of coldness on the can so that you don't smell those things like we're drinking this at room temp because that's where most of the aromas are available i love you coors no, we don't. Like, okay, we love that you made a decent quality product available nationally and globally, but like, you killed our ability to taste good things because we grew up tasting terrible things. I don't know if they're fully to blame, but there's okay. someone. <laughs> That's true. I'm sure that those people are like, this is good beer. Everyone deserves to have it. And as they scaled, they changed the grain bill from 100% grain to corn and rice and grain. And now it's like mostly corn and rice, right? And it's not even grain anymore. Fair enough. <sighs> but anyways, we're using tulip glasses to smell the mead because it enhances aroma. Um, Is there any other glassware out there that enhances aroma? <laughs> There's a lot of glassware that enhances okay. aroma. So champagne glasses do, um, wine glasses do, right? Like a big red wine glass, there's different shapes. But basically, think about this liquid and then zoom in on the molecules. As the coolness of this liquid, relative coolness, like that's probably 55, 60 degrees, the bottle, mm -hmm. and their air is 74 degrees. So there's a gradient there between the liquid and the room temp. And as the air warms up the liquid, it's grabbing molecules off of the surface of the liquid and turning them into aromas, into gas. And so this glass holds those like perfume and just as with perfume when you get closer to someone it smells different than when you're further away from them same thing going on here if you just sniff up here you get one set of aromas and then if you put your nose all the way in the glass and you sniff it you get different aromas right yeah so how would you characterize the aromas at the top of the glass versus the aromas at the bottom of the glass i feel like at the top of the glass for me it's more floral more light more like lemony mm -hmm. and then when i go all the way in i just get like straight tangerine orange like fruit cool is where i go with it yeah 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 and one of the cool things about tasting with people is like brando's experience is going to be different than mine just mm -hmm. like you know the listener's experience is going to be different from their friends and it's not that you're wrong and i'm right or i'm wrong and you're right it's that we are different humans having different experiences, and when we share them with each other, our experience gets richer. Mm -hmm. Like, 
if we were just alone all the time, we'd only have our own experiences. But when we hang out with other people, we see the world and smell the world and taste the world through their lens. Yeah. And we get to, like, the, the angles at which we can view reality increase. And so reality becomes this richer, potentially more beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. So what are you smelling yeah. at the top? Thanks, man. Uh, so, mm, I get more, like, orange blossom, but also citrus peel in okay. the nose. Like, up high, when I'm just putting my mustache. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> when I put my nose to the rim of the glass, mm -hmm. I sniff, and I get, it's, like, much more delicate. It's, yeah. It's, like, a little bit of orange candy. A little bit of, of like breadiness. There's some like, uh, what's that called? Crust of the bread, like crust of a sourdough almost. Okay. But it's not tart. It's like it's just rich. It smells good. Yeah. I and then, that. and then I go in, and I get like fermented honey notes. I mean, I've been around fermented honey long enough that like the smell of fermented honey makes me happy. It's also kind of like putting your nose into a beehive. I don't know if anyone's ever done that. I, I personally haven't. Yeah. I'd be scared of my nose getting cool. stung. But... <laughs> That's wise. You generally have a veil <laughs> okay. when you do this. <laughs> Fair. Uh, yes, but I appreciate that you went there. And you're like, that does not compute because that would mean my face was supposed to be. <laughs> Let me add one detail to your mental model. <laughs> I just think of the Encanto dad. Oh yeah, <laughs> I <like> get stung, <laughs> just my nose popping out. Yeah, yeah, he has bad luck with that. Uh, so, I do get tangerine. Um, I do get citrus and some lemoniness, but I also get this just wonderful fermented honey note that I like a lot. Yeah. Um, but it, it should be stated that you know my this is like number ten thousand of mead that I've tasted. Whereas most people in the world have maybe tasted a few. Uh, and if they're really into mead, have tasted probably hundreds. But like after 10 years of making mead and drinking it, I don't know, 250 days out of the year? Yeah. Like, that's only 25,000. Only. So. And my nose is much more fresh. I'm in the hundreds probably. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then, like, we'll probably have some listeners who are in the, like, Teens? Teens. That's, maybe that's maybe less than yeah, teens? Maybe it's their first time. Right? So um, so everyone's going to have different experiences. We'd love to hear if you get a chance to try the mini Ola Sunshine Rain, uh, what you taste yeah. and smell. All right. Anything else to add to Sniff, or you feel like that's a good covering of the sniff -ass? I mean, uh, it, it should be mentioned that the part of our brain that smells things and the part of our brain that remembers things are right next to each other, and they're somewhere deep down there. Ken Tram, again, knows where they actually are in our brain, um, but it's like near the medulla oblongata, right? Like Perfect. lizard brain. Like. I'm sure you pronounced that perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I watched Waterboy. <laughs> Um, so the medulla oblongata is, uh, like our reptile brain, right? And what reptiles lick the air. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, does that mean prey or does that mean death? <laughs> right. And so that's deep in us. And when we bring in these molecules, which modern science is beginning to show us are like these super complex three dimensional crystals that are wrapped up around each other. And like they dissolve very quickly when they hit our tongue. So we don't know what we're looking at. But recently they've been able to do this fractional geometry microchemistry where they flash freeze individual flavor molecules and then they take pictures of them and they're able to see that like, oh, tannin is this molecule that has a unique shape. Mm -hmm. And when it's an oak tannin versus a cedar tannin, they're shaped differently. Mm -hmm. And like our body has these receptacles for those flavors. Anyways, I can go for a long time about this, but the, the summary is when you breathe in this, this gas, it goes into your nasal cavity and in your nasal cavity, your olfactory bulb, which is part of your brain, which is like a bundle of neurons, sits at this um, interface that has a little bit of you know, flesh and mucous membranes, but then like the gas is basically transferred to the olfactory bulb and your brain is getting touched by what you're smelling. 
Yeah. And so, you know, signals are fired to your brain and they're like, oh, that's a smell. And it goes back to that smell things, remember things, part of the brain. And your brain does this like reference check where it's like, I smelled that before. Oh, it's lemon. Okay, cool. Oh, I smelled that before. Oh, that's fermenting honey in yeah. my case. But in your case, it's like... It's more coffee related probably with like the acidity of like an orange or a lemon is where my mind went. Right? So like, it's pretty cool. Like we're talking about your unique human history and my unique human history and like we're gonna have this shared experience and now we're gonna have like a shared mm -hmm. unique human history that's true so. i think it's also important to mention that what you just described has an impact on the next four s's like all around like it's it's like it's it's more than half your taste essentially um, your olfactory is your, your sense of smell impacts what you're tasting with your tongue and, and your savor and your swallow and it, like all the way through it's impacting the whole experience and your hedonistic sense right so hedonistic um, evaluation is ultimately this question do you like it or not yeah and like ultimately that's your decision to make mm -hmm. um, and depending on what your references are you know if like you're in a citrus grove and someone started throwing rotten citrus at you you might like be totally averse to this mean yeah but hopefully citrus experiences have been pleasant for you and so when you drink this mead and like honey has been pleasant for you and you're like oh this is actually a joyful wonderful experience yeah and my mind my mind goes to coffee again which is i've been on farms where when they depulp the cherry they just have like mountains of like deep pulp cherries rotting cherry yeah and, and it smells like a ferment rotty very terrible pulpy smell and before i experienced that i enjoyed natural coffees which is a process of coffee where they dry the the cherry on the coffee mm. and it it produces a lot sweeter fruitier cup essentially rather than a washed where they just wash it off right away yeah and so but ever since that experience with that nasty fermenting pulp smell whenever i smell a natural coffee i always immediately go back to farms where they like have those large mounds of dirty fermenting pulp and i my my experience with most natural coffees now are more negative than positive <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and it's because of that experience with bad terrible uh, wow. rotten pulp yeah. on the farms that I have that experience now. Wow, dude. So, A, B. Like, before, mm -hmm. A, it was good. Yeah, I did After, B, <laughs> not so nice. <laughs> That's where my mind goes. So, yeah. 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 Cool. Well, um, we can, so, hopefully that helps empower the drinker to know that their mm -hmm. experience is unique to them and ultimately it comes down to their designation of hedonistic preference. Yeah. You know, do you like it or not? No one else can tell you whether you should or shouldn't and whether you're right or wrong. And all you can really do is tune in at, to that why and verbalize it. Yeah. It's like it's bringing me back to this experience and it's bringing me back to here. And that's why even though if I think about it objectively, it doesn't taste terrible. This is why I don't like it. That's so cool. So then I think there's a ground. So. Often one of the things that we love about mead is that people can mead in the middle, mm -hmm. right? So if like one person drinks beer and another pe person drinks wine and they've been having a hard time finding a drink that works for both of them, like mead is this third option that has some crossover potential between both. And when folks come together, if they come with an open mind and like a willingness to engage each other and the thing in front of them, there's a chance they're gonna find something that makes them both feel good and, mm -hmm. and enjoy their time together. Yeah. So. Um, we like to talk about meeting in the middle, but that requires an open mind mm -hmm. and it requires a sense of like respect and appreciation of the other person. Yeah. Um, so the chance for me to build bridges is literally like creating experiences together and in a way creating like a shared mental awareness of reality. So meeting in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. On to sip. Now, do you want to describe this step? Yeah, so this is where first impression is key. Um, with sip, you're just paying attention to that first note or 
setup notes that hit before you swish it around, before you swallow it, right? Like if you're doing professional tasting or really intense tasting, you'd spit right after that first sip to really capture Oh wow. That first experience. So you just like sip and then spit. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And the French uh, have a word for this in wine called the attack. Um, and there's a cool study from UC Berkeley about based off the native language of the drinker, uh, whether they're English speakers, uh, Chinese speakers or French speakers drinking the same wine, they have different descriptors for the same wines. 